Okay, I will begin. So good morning, and this is lecture number three for the Principles of Marketing class at Soulbridge International School of Business. Uh, today's topic is a central topic in uh, marketing, and that will be customers and value. So what have we done so far? Again, as you know, the course is roughly split into two parts. The first part is the uh, how we understand the market, getting information about the market. Uh, the second part is shaping the market, how we can influence the market. We did uh, over the last two sessions an introduction and overview. And then last week we did marketing strategy. Uh, today, we will focus on customers and value. So we'll spend a few moments reviewing from the last lecture. Uh, and if you have any questions, please type them <clears throat> into the chat room. But this is just a quick uh, review, and then we'll go on to the main topic. So what is strategy and why is strategy important? Uh, we'll review a few of the strategy frameworks and the very important concept in marketing and marketing strategy, the four P's of the marketing mix, product, price, placement, and promotion. And then we'll talk a little bit about the marketing plan. As you know, we will be splitting into groups at the end to present the marketing plan. Uh, five people, uh, around five people. So if you can start to develop those groups and start to think of the idea that you want to market create a market for. So that could be a product. It could be uh, <clears throat> a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, it could be a service and not just a business oriented uh, effort. So uh, strategy is about making choices on what an organization will seek to achieve and how it will achieve it. Uh, that's Michael Porter, one of the chief gurus uh, out of Harvard Business School and strategy. And very important strategy uh, is often misunderstood to be kind of a vague ambition or goal, but it is a very clear thing. It's a unique uh, and a valuable position in the market or in a situation. So there are many ways we can construe this strategy. For example, serving the few needs of many customers so focusing, again, in some unique and valuable position, serving the broad needs of just a few customers or serving the broad needs of many customers in a narrow market. So these are possible unique and valuable positions. Also, very important concept and strategy is uh, it is involved in choosing what not to do. Uh, sometimes people construe strategy as uh, we want to be the best or the greatest. We want to be the best company. <clears throat> we want to have the best products. Uh, and of course, that could mean anything. And the uh, strategy is choosing what not to do. And it inev inevitably involves trade-offs. So do we want to be the lowest cost? Well, that might influence the quality. Do we want to be the fastest to market? Uh, that might uh, influence uh, how broad you are in that market. So strategy typically involves trade-offs, and those trade-offs will imply <clears throat> some choice of what not to do. And as we emphasized uh, last week, strategy is not the same as operational effectiveness. So uh, doing your uh, company production more efficiently, uh, doing your operations more effectively, uh, these are all very important for business function, but they're not the same as a strategy. <clears throat> and the reason why is that fundamentally uh, doing things just better uh, or more efficient is not unique and valuable. Uh, people will replicate that. And by definition, it involves a benchmark that can be copied. And so long-term sustainability of that strategy is uh, not possible. And so strategy as differentiated from tactics is more long-term. We have to think of unique and valuable positions, whereas operational effectiveness in some way 
is tactics uh, because it is intrinsically short term. So to summarize this, what is strategy? Michael Porter uh, describes strategy as the organization's distinctive approach to, compel uh, to competing and the competitive advantages on which it's be based. So the other aspect of strategy is creating a fit with the company's activities, its capabilities, <clears throat> its scope, and uh, uh, its environment. So choosing a distinctive approach and making it fit with the situation is the essence of strategy. We talked about some frameworks for strategy. This is Ansoff's opportunity matrix uh, describing a strategy as being market driven or product driven and uh, entering existing markets or new markets. And we have four different general strategy positions based on that. The market penetration uh, strategy in existing products, existing markets, uh, taking a greater share of an existing market. An example of that is the, the cheese industry with Kraft Foods. Uh, market development, uh, <clears throat> using a base of existing products to grow, a uh, new type of product uh, based on that existing product. So the example is McDonald's, uh, developing new products, ice cream, coffee, etc. cetera. Uh, product development would be uh, uh, developing a new product for existing markets, and that's of course Intel is a good example. New microprocessors, faster microprocessors uh, to <clears throat> create new products for existing personal computer or server markets, whatever. And then, of course, uh, the most risky strategy is the new market, new products, and a good example of that would be Apple and the iPhone. Another very important framework for uh, strategy is that of SWOT analysis. SWOT stands for strengths, opportunities, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we can create a two by two matrix of these describing the internal aspects of the company. And those are on the positive side, the strengths, and on the negative side, the weaknesses. And then also describing the external environment to the company. Uh, and that would be on the positive side, the opportunities, and on the negative side, the threats, and hence uh, SWATs, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So in your marketing plan, you want to do an analysis of uh, the existing organization's strengths and weaknesses. You want to do an analysis of the outside environment. What are the possibilities? What are the challenges? And so we then have a little more focus on the strategies. What are the strategies that uh, optimize the strength and opportunity mix? What are the strategies that optimize the strength and threats uh, uh, link? And likewise, weakness opportunity and weakness threats. So you optimize things and that's a way of creating that fit to uh, between all of these elements inside and outside the fit uh, the capabilities, the weaknesses, and so forth with a strategy. So SWOT analysis is very important. And lastly, we talk about the marketing mix. It is fundamentally principle in marketing. We have four parts, uh, the product, the pricing, the placement, which is another way of saying distribution. Where do we sell this uh, product or service? And the promotion. It's interesting, most people think about marketing, and we discussed this in lecture number one, as promotion. Uh, in other words, advertising, uh, public relations, sales, and so forth. Uh, most people uh, who don't have you know, experience or who uh, have not taken a course such as this uh, may think of marketing as essentially just this uh, advertising, if you will. But it really is only one component of it. Uh, creating a good product, is part of marketing, uh, creating a market that fits with customer expectations. And that's why this lecture about customers and value is so important. Creating a product that's valuable uh, is very important. So this first P of the product, the functionality, the brand, the packaging, what services are associated with the product is a very important part of marketing. And so there's also an intersection between marketing and research and development. 
uh, as explored in the readings in the second reading, and we'll talk about it at the end of the lecture. Uh, what is that relationship between marketing and R&D? Are they really separate? And my argument uh, today will be they are not separate. A very good R&D involves a marketing mindset, and very good marketing is not just about advertising, but also involves a very good R&D uh, mindset. Of course, it depends on the type of industry and so forth, but uh, the general concept holds that uh, developing innovative new products that fit the market is uh, the core of very successful businesses. Uh, and then price uh, is very important and that's related to value and that's why the topic of today's lecture is customers and value. So how do we determine the price? Well, of course, that depends on you know, how we understand what value is. And we're gonna explore the concept of value <clears throat> at some length today. Uh, placement is very important. You know, where do we sell this? Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, here, uh, I am uh, working from home, as many of you are and many around the world. And uh, it is challenging to go to a store and uh, potentially be in a crowd and uh, not have the social distancing. So the offline stores for groceries or whatever it may be can be a challenge in this environment. We are very fortunate in Korea that we don't have a very extensive lockdown. So people can go to stores and they're open and so forth. But it is a challenge in the official recommendation, of course, which everyone should follow, is we want to minimize our time in crowds. So everybody has talked about e-commerce and online and deliveries and so forth. And uh, that's very, uh, has been growing because people don't want to go to the stores as much, so they're getting the deliveries. And we've seen increases, even in the context of economic uh, challenges, increase in the online channel. So that's the place. But there's another channel that's very interesting and it's kind of an old channel. Uh, where I live here in Itaewon, there are sometimes some small trucks that go up and down the street selling vegetables, uh, selling fruit, selling uh, seafood uh, in ice bo uh, boxes and so forth. And uh, these are kind of old style. The, the man or the woman is yelling and they're saying, Ojingo, Ojingo is uh, uh, squid. Ojingo, Muno, squid, octopus, or yache, which is vegetables. And it's kind of like old style. But I see more of them. And that placement of the old style trucks going around and people going out of their home and then quickly buying what they want uh, is very interesting. And uh, that's the placement that may fit with this particular environment. So we'll see how that plays out, but placement is very important. And finally, and I put it finally because most people think, as I mentioned, it can be the most important thing in marketing, but actually finally is the promotion, which is the advertising, sales force, publicity, sales promotion, and related activities. So uh, we want to, again, according to the structure of the course, uh, learning about the market and also uh, shaping the market, there's an inside out perspective. We put the products out, but also an outside in perspective where we learn from the market and develop our products accordingly. So uh, great companies have a combination of these. They, they have a core, which they try to develop and uh, put out into the market. Good products, a good technology, good engineers, good R&D and so forth. But then also good companies uh, are sensitive to the market. They will adapt and change. And so the reading, particularly the second reading for today, emphasizes this uh, tension between the R&D and the marketing, and in essence, this inside out versus outside in perspective. Uh, very important to know the marketing environment. And so we will talk about market analysis and all that in more detail, but to summarize, there's a macro environment which includes the political, economic, social, technological, legal, uh, ecological aspects. So of course, climate change. Now we have a pandemic. Uh, these are very big global macro issues, but they influence uh, 
an individual, a company, and how they do their sales. So the man in the truck now sees that his uh, business is uh, potentially uh, more valuable during this pandemic, whereas uh, the regular stores may find that this environment creates more difficulty. And so the macro environment uh, from all of these elements, regulatory, legal, ecological, and so forth, do influence uh, marketing decisions. And then, of, of course, there's the micro environment uh, of your customers, which we'll talk at length uh, shortly, the employees, the suppliers, uh, media, uh, and uh, other stakeholders in your company. So two key principles, again, uh, understanding the market and shaping the market. We'll talk more uh, in the second half of the course about pricing strategies. But price is very important because product, place, and promotion of the four Ps, they all have costs. It costs money to develop a product. It costs money to develop a channel, uh, sales costs, uh, commissions, and so forth. And of course, it costs money to do advertising and promotion. Uh, so all of these have costs. And essentially, the fourth, the, the, the P, the price, is the only one that actually creates revenue. So this is a very important uh, strategy. We have market-based strategies based on what's coming from that would be kind of outside in. We have product-based strategies that would be in a way inside out. And we have cost-value-based processing, uh, pricing. And uh, we'll talk about value uh, during this lecture, and this will be very important. And what are some of the factors in price, uh, fixed and variable costs, uh, competition, obviously other prices, what are the company objectives, what are the company values, uh, proposed positioning strategies. So for example, Apple uh, typically has higher prices, it's positioned more for uh, wealthier customers, it's more of a premium brand, and uh, other uh, companies such as No Brand or E Emart in in Korea are positioning more for uh, a wider market and not necessarily just a premium brand. So uh, these pricings involve an, quite a number of factors. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of pricing strategies which we'll talk about. So that's a quick review of the last lecture. Uh, today we're gonna uh, any questions. Let's, before we start, do you want to type in any questions? So I think it's a pretty straightforward. Uh, let's start with uh, the main topic for today, which is customers and value. So first, we want to address the issue, what is value? Second, we want to address the issue, what are, what are customers? I know that may sound obvious. Uh, but we want to really understand uh, in a little more detail what these concepts mean. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the reading, uh, market-oriented business, cross-functional R&D, and marketing integration. So what is value? Uh, why don't we get a few answers uh, from uh, students? Uh, you can type it in. Uh, and I'll read it for everybody. Just type in what you think. What What is your uh, understanding of value? So, uh, so Jung Hyun says something that has meaning to the customer. So obviously customers and value are connected. That's why we talk about that in the same lecture. So that's a good answer. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts? What is value? Importance of product and quality. Something you can receive when you buy a product. something that has a high demand, that's a good answer. So that's a very interesting answer. Value is not defined by what you think is value, but rather what the market thinks is value, what other people are thinking. The importance or worth of something for someone. So that's very interesting. Uh, so Jung Hyun says something that has a high demand, which implies value is what other people think. 
And then uh, Daria Zukova says the importance of worth of something for someone. So in other words, what that person thinks. So there's an interesting tension. What is valuable? Is that valuable to the target customer? Or is the value to the target customer determined by what actually others think? So uh, this is great answers because I think we find it very hard actually to understand what value is. So what I will talk about is the many dimensions of value. Uh, value, first of all, is customer defined, a little bit what Daria said, but that customer could be broad, a little bit like what So Jung Yun said, uh, not just the customer, but other customers. So it's a very interesting concept. Second thing, which I think uh, is suggested by the diversity of answers here is value is opaque. Opaque means kind of dark, not easy to uh, discern. Uh, in other words, we don't always really know what value is. And that in itself is a valuable comment, or how should I say, valuable part of the definition. Uh, value also depends on the context. You know, uh, President Moon announced a vaccine initiative yesterday. I think uh, 200 uh, 10 billion won, about 170 million US dollars, uh, effort to uh, develop a vaccine. The context right now is very high for a vaccine, it's very valuable. One year ago, nobody really thought a vaccine for coronavirus, uh, including the existing coronavirus, it's not just the new one, but uh, it was not a big deal. There was not a lot of value. But the context now has obviously changed. Uh, value is multidimensional. Value often involves a trade-off. I mean, you may want something of high quality, but you also value low cost. Uh, you cannot necessarily have everything. For example, with this vaccine, we may want the perfect vaccine, but on the other hand, we need to get one now or soon. So there will be trade-offs in the value uh, as that project develops. And also value is relative. Uh, so it depends. Uh, one reason why a vaccine is very important is antiviral medicine. Uh, it is important, of course, as well, but uh, a pure cure for viral infections is impossible. A virus is not a, a living thing, so you can't really kill it, as opposed to antibiotics for bacteria. Bacteria are living, and some antibiotics actually kill the bacteria, which is why penicillin and other magic medicine are so powerful. We don't really have the same thing for antivirals. So uh, some antiviral medicine can slow down the virus, so they have some value. But it's, as I mentioned, it's relative, so vaccine in viral disease, diseases is much more valuable than uh, treatments. Uh, it might be a little bit different than bacterial diseases. Bacterial diseases, we have those antibiotics that can kill bacteria. So antibacterials, anti relatively more important than vaccines. So value is, is relative. So let's go through these. So finally, I wanna say value is a mindset. And that's the final point I wanna make in today's lecture uh, how do we have the right mindset, the marketing mindset to understand value? Okay, so uh, this discussion is based on uh, perhaps uh, one of the top leading uh, professors, Mohambir Swani. Uh, in technology marketing. He's based at Northwestern University uh, uh, School of Business, and that's one of the leading centers for uh, marketing. Uh, so he wrote the article, Fundamentals of Customer Value. It's in your readings, and we are going to uh, develop these concepts uh, similar to that framework. So to create successful customer relationships, companies must understand what their customers care about and what value proposition appeals to them. But as he notes in the beginning, 
uh, value is a very common word. Everybody uses the word value. Uh, everybody wants to feel that they're doing something valuable, but we rarely pause to reflect if we really understand what value is. And so we're going to go through uh, some of that. So first concept, the value is customer defined. And a uh, famous Roman once uh, wrote, everything is worth what its purchaser will pay for it. The value is customer defined. And I said in the first lecture, there was a very interesting concept in the Korean language. Uh, chota, this first word here, means to uh, be good. So you say something is good, you say ego uh, chwayo, uh, ego chota, this is good. And then choahada is to like. Uh, so if I like this thing, I said ego sil chuaheo, I like it. But if you if you notice, they are very you know similar. And uh, what is good is what is liked, or to like is to make it good. So there's an interesting correlation between that. So what is valuable, what is good, is also related to what is liked. And so this is a very fundamental idea. And I like to say that the, in, this makes uh, the Korean mindset perfect for marketing. So if we're sensitive to what is liked and what people like, then we can create valuable things for those people. So the first law of marketing, if there's a law kind of like in physics, is what you sell, products and services, is not exactly what customers buy. Uh, which is related to the utility and value. So this is the fundamental issue of marketing. You have some product or service and you think that it has a certain value, but in reality, what's important is what the customers think and what they are buying. Now that may seem obvious, but it is not so obvious. And so I'm going to give some examples. So for example, you have a product which is a mouse trap. A mouse trap is a device that uh, will trap the my mice, and that was actually very important in previous pandemics and previous plagues, where rats and mice might be spreading disease. So uh, that product uh, is an important product, but you're not actually selling that product. Uh, you're selling the ability of people to get rid of mice. So if there's another product that also gets rid of mice, then that's going to be valuable because they not there to buy your product, their the customer is there to get rid of mice. So I'll give you another powerful example. This is uh, Lorenzo Zambrano of Mexico, one of the world's richest uh, men. And he has a, a company where they develop, a con they, they sell, produce and sell cement and concrete. The country is Cemex, very powerful company. And it's very interesting. I, I love this comment because it encapsulates this concept of the first law of marketing perfectly. He says, no one wants to buy cement. Instead, they want to build a house or a bridge or a road. You don't sit there and say, my life dream is to buy concrete. I love buying concrete. I just want to buy a big pile of concrete. Nobody says that. No, they have a goal that they want to achieve. They want to build something. And of course, the concrete and the cement is a mechanism for them to achieve that goal. So this is very interesting because that's a marketing mindset. Uh, if you can meet with your product, what is actually the customer value, what they actually are trying to achieve, that is a very powerful mechanism to be successful. So value is customer defined. Second concept is value is opaque. Uh, in other words, uh, Peter Drucker, another famous uh, business uh, guru, most of you might be familiar, what is value for the customer is anything but obvious. So even though 
uh, I've said in the previous slide what may be very powerful. We don't really know what the customer always wants. Uh, and in fact, even the customer doesn't always know what they want. And Steve Jobs, many people think is a technology genius, but Steve Jobs of Apple and other companies was more of a marketing genius. And he's famously said, uh, I develop products that people don't even know that they want. Uh, 20 years ago, people didn't say, I want to have an iPhone. Give me that iPhone. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs created that, and now they want to have the iPhone, but this was a product that didn't exist, and people were not really aware of, and he met uh, some of those needs. Uh, one way to think of that mindset is reframing what the customer may be thinking. So Steve Jobs of Apple also developed uh, these personal computers that were very easy to use uh, 30 years ago and so forth. And he also famously said uh, the personal computer that we designed, the Apple Mac, is like a bicycle for the mind. So a bicycle is easy to use. It obviously makes people go faster, longer. So it is a tool. Uh, so the computer, as he construed it, was a bicycle for the mind. So why is value opaque? Uh, we don't always understand customers. Customers don't always understand themselves. That's the Steve Jobs example. And this is very important, especially in technology marketing, not speaking the same language. So the technologists, the engineers might be talking about uh, various technical things. We want to sell these uh, monitors. They have the they have the HD TV, they have the aspect ratio, they have all sorts of technical uh, characteristics. And of course, for some experts or small market niches, this may be important, but people don't buy something for aspect ratio. Uh, they don't buy something for any particular technical point. They want to just uh, see their shows more easily. They wanna see certain detail. They, they wanna have a bigger screen, whatever it may be. Uh, that uh, fits with their needs. And that's not always uh, clear. And the same language is not always clear. So the first principle of customer research, this is also Mohan Swani, the famous professor out of Northwestern. I have met the customer and she is not me. And there's a very famous movie. It's a comedy movie, What Women Want, with Mel Gibson and Helen Hunt. And Mel Gibson uh, was a marketing executive. And he got a new job, a new project to sell things for women. And it's a great movie because it highlights this concept of uh, value is opaque and getting in the mind of the customer. And of course, very famously, uh, as a kind of a joke, men don't understand women and the women don't understand men. So what is this man? Uh, marketing executive Mel Gibson trying to sell uh, products for women. So he decides in this comedy to get into the life of a woman. So he goes into these exercise classes, he wears pantyhose, he does all these things, it's very funny and all that. Uh, but the serious point is he's trying to understand and get into the mind of uh, somebody completely outside of his experience. And that is a comedy on one level, but it also is a central message of marketing. So a third concept is value is contextual. So we have several uh, dimensions or contexts of the value. Uh, and three of them are the actual user. Who are they? That will determine the context of the value. Who is the actual customer? So uh, this is very important. For example, uh, let's say in healthcare, uh, who is the user of healthcare? You might say the patient, but uh, also the government insurance or the insurance company is paying for that. And are they the user uh, if you're selling a product, a healthcare product? And of course, there's the doctors and the nurses. They, are they the user? So exactly who is the user is not always uh, exactly clear. Uh, 
also in healthcare, for example, we talked about uh, some differences between women and men. Uh, in healthcare marketing and healthcare products, uh, uh, there's a concept that often the women in a household, in a family, often drive the healthcare uh, use. Uh, the, the patient or the end person may be the children, uh, may be the husband, but in fact, it's often uh, the, the woman in the family that's driving that. So who exactly is the end user and what is the context is not always known, but that's very important to know. And then there's the end use situation. What do they actually want to do with that? So that's the example of the concrete or cement. Uh, what do you want to do with that product uh, is very important. And then the environment where they live and work uh, is uh, critical to the value. We gave the example of the pandemic that we are experiencing now, and that creates an environment where uh, establishing some social distancing becomes very important to the placement of that product and, and then the value of that. So context is the essence of customer segmentation. A very important concept in marketing is customer segmentation. Uh, who is the target customer and what is the context of that? So here's an example. If you're selling a computer, are you selling the computer for a sales professional, a more business oriented person, or are you selling the computer for a design e engineer? So if we look at uh, one of the big differences between Apple computers and uh, PC compatibles, very different uh, customer segmentations. The Apple's at least more originally were more for technical people, graphics oriented people, artistic oriented people, whereas the uh, PC compatibles, IBM compatibles, Windows computers were more for business types uh, and uh, general use. So that was an example of customer segmentation. So we have different types of customer segments, which we'll talk more in a later lecture on market analysis. Convenience seekers, brand buyers, casual buyers, relationship seekers, uh, bargain hunters, and there's a different uh, amount of, of value associated with them. Uh, the convenience seekers, for example, if your segment is for people who want convenience, they may pay more. This is one reason why the prices in the convenience store, the peony jump, uh, is typically higher than uh, in an e-mart or a big uh, big store. It's more convenient to just go to the corner and get something. So they tend to you know, have a certain type of uh, value associated with that. And of course, the bargain hunters is another customer segment. Very important concept uh, of context is the mega trends. Uh, this is the macro environment, the demographics, uh, politics, cultural effects uh, are very important determinants of value. So another very important uh, concept in value is that it is multidimensional. Uh, so the features and functions, the functional value is important, but it's not the only criteria of value. So we have three dimensions of values, a functional of the product, the economic value, so what the person actually benefits from that, does it save them money, does it make them more productive, uh, that's the economic value, it's not exactly the same as the functional value, and the emotional value. So many product based companies or technology based companies will focus on the functional value. You make a computer and you say it has a certain speed, it has a certain memory, a certain uh, uh, ports and uh, functions. But the economic value is, does it uh, allow the person to um, you know, complete their homework and uh, get their degree and get a job? Or does it uh, help the company uh, perform its uh, job and, and get some economic value that way. There's also an emotional aspect. And a perfect example is here. 
This is uh, uh, not Kim Jong-un, but I think his uh, father in the North Korea. And you see here in a parade uh, in a Mercedes Benz. So the Mercedes Benz has a certain functional value to go from <clears throat> one point to another. That's what a car does. But most of the decision to use this Mercedes Benz is essentially emotional, uh, about self-image, about power, control, affiliation, and so forth, and image. So uh, many people buy cars not just for the function, but as you well know, for the emotional aspect. Uh, BMW, obviously famous maker of cars, competitor to Mercedes-Benz, has a marketing concept. They don't sell cars. It's called the BMW driving experience. The driving experience is an emotional response uh, to the car. Uh, so this emotional dimension of value is extremely important. The functional value is not the only criteria for value. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, value is a trade-off. So value is defined as the perceived worth of something in relation to the total cost. So there's trade-off between total benefits, total costs. So it's very important when you're understanding value that you look at that uh, total cost. So for example, someone buys a computer a desktop, <clears throat> that's a certain size that's gonna take up room on their desk uh, and uh, they may want to have a smaller you know, smartphone. Smartphone is also essentially a computer, but there's a trade-off. The desktop may have more power, may be better for gaming, whatever, may connect to more screens, whereas the smartphone uh, would be less power, less monitors and so forth. So value is a trade-off. The total benefits, total costs, other costs, uh, direct costs, indirect costs. <clears throat> so well, one aspect to value is uh, this concept and, and its competition with other things is this concept of buying decisions. So motivation versus friction in buying decisions. So if we want to create something value or valuable and sell it and make that transition, uh, minimizing friction is almost always better than increasing motivation. In other words, there's an, often a lot of competition and trade-offs to the value of something. So instead of making something even more and more valuable to increase the motivation, if you can lower the cost to it, or competing costs or trade-off to get that value, that can be the most powerful way to uh, <clears throat> increase the buying decision. So that's a very interesting concept. Most people think of value as the, the product itself, but it's relationship and trade-offs. If you buy something, by definition, that means you have less money to buy other things. So, or you have to spend time to buy that thing. So you have less time to do other things. If you can minimize that offsetting cost, if you can minimize that trade-off, that indirectly, of course, increases the value of what you're offering. So value is relative. As I, as I implied, there are other competing things. So concept of next best alternative or best available substitute or equivalent are very important in uh, value perception. So uh, the customer is thinking, what is the problem to be solved? And the supplier, the company with the uh, selling the, the device or the product, how does my offer, has to be thinking, how does my offering compare to the next best alternative? <clears throat> uh, if you're uh, buying uh, cement, for example, and uh, the next best alternative is another cement company, if, uh, or to use steel, or to use uh, wood, you know, these are all aspects. If you're doing travel, uh, the alternatives are KTX, airplane, car, 
uh, what is the best next alternative? And that value is going to be relative to that. So the value is not just that device or product or service, it's also related to the alternatives. So what is the best available substitute or equivalent? Those are the competitors, those are the obvious ones. So if you're flying an airplane, uh, that would be other airplane companies. It would also be other modes of transport, uh, train, car, uh, et cetera. Uh, another uh, alternative is your own products within your own uh, company, if you have multiple products. And very important next best alternative is the status quo. What is the status quo? Status quo is the existing situation. The existing situation is a competitor to value. In other words, doing nothing. So for example, we look at the vaccine for COVID-19. People have been trying to develop vaccines for coronavirus. We had SARS and MERS, which are also coronaviruses. The next best alternative is not to do anything. That's the status quo. So, um, or to work on something else uh, that would be competitors, a vaccine for Ebola or whatever. So uh, that uh, status quo is very powerful. And obviously we are now in a difficult situation because this status quo is a very powerful motivator. In other words, not to change, not to increase. So when we look at this relative concept, there are two parameters to consider. There's the value of the product itself uh, with respect to the alternatives. And of course, that's complex. It's opaque, multidimensional, it's contextual and so forth. And then there's actually the ease of switching. How do we switch to that product? <clears throat> Financial, uh, cognitive, behavioral, uh, and so forth. So finally, I want to uh, emphasize that value is a mindset. And uh, we have two mindsets to think about. One is a product uh, mindset. Uh, and that's the left-hand side of this chart here. And the second one is the customer value mindset. So uh, in the customer value mindset, uh, we focus on what the customer thinks is value. And these have implications for how we do the strategy, the strategic focus, what are the drivers of growth, uh, what types of products we offer, what is our pricing strategy, what is our sales organization, marketing operations, success metrics, monitoring and tracking. So all of these dimensions will be influenced by whether we have a product focus and a custom or a customer value focus. So for example, in the strategic aspect, if we have a product mindset, we, our strategy is to develop uh, innovative products, adding features to products. It's a, essentially a cust product leadership strategy. <clears throat> if we have a customer value mindset, uh, we uh, create value by delivering superior value to the customers and knowing what they want. Uh, the different types of growth will be selling broadly to new customers if it's a product mindset. In customer value, value because we're really trying to meet the customer to sell deeply to existing uh, customers. Uh, in the product mindset, we have uh, horizontal products with limited customization because we're driving from the product. In the customer value, vertical solutions uh, and uh, working with partners to design better solutions uh, focused on the outside, on the customer. <clears throat> so this has other implications along other dimensions. Uh, this is in your notes that you can uh, delve into more detail, but value is uh, a mindset. So I'd like to uh, focus on the next section on what are your customers? Who are your customers? Uh, let's take a, uh, seven minute break here, it's 9.53, and we will return at 10, and uh, we will continue with the second part of the lecture, what are your customers? So uh, uh, you can also type your questions into the chat room, and I'll address some of those as we uh, continue 
in the next uh, part. So let's take a six minute break here. We'll start again at 10. Okay, welcome back. We are going to start again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, that was a uh, Google. Uh, uh, listening in. So uh, let's uh, continue. Uh, the second part of the lecture is about customers. So what are your customers? Who are your customers? So we have a concept such as a B2B, business to business, B2C, business to consumer, uh, B2B to C, business to business to consumer, and et cetera. So who are you selling to? Uh, to businesses, to consumers, to businesses, and then to consumers. And uh, this may seem like an obvious uh, question or the obvious answer, but it's not always clear. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about customer segmentation, customer value hierarchy, uh, the difference between customers versus stakeholders. So, uh, B to B, uh, B to C, B to C, B to C. Let's uh, do a little bit of definitions. Uh, this is just a chart describing this. Uh, B to B is business to business. Uh, B to C is business to consumer. B to G is business to government. Uh, C to B is consumer to business. Uh, C to C or P to P is uh, consumer to consumer uh, and so forth. So these are some examples as you can see here. So uh, let's talk about uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, is it B2B or B2B2C? Uh, pharmaceutical industry, it depends on the context. context. This is selling uh, uh, medicines. Uh, who's actually buying that? So uh, in Korea, the national insurance buys that, but also the customer, the patient may pay a little bit. So is it B2B, in other words, or B2G, uh, or is it B2B2C? So for example, the doctor actually prescribes it. So that's uh, in a way B2B, and then, uh, then to the uh, patient. So it's not always very clear. So uh, these distinctions are important, but many complex industries will have uh, not easy to break down into these categories. This leads to the concept of direct-to-consumer marketing, uh, direct-to-consumer, uh, which is not uh, legal actually in Korea, but you'll see that in the United States where uh, a drug company will advertise for a prescription drug and uh, describe uh, what disease it may be uh, indicated for and suggest to the patient that they talk to their doctor. So the advertising is to the patient but uh, the drug company is supplying to uh, a marketing to the doctor, but actually selling to the pharmacy and the pharmacy sells to the consumer. So this is a very complex model. So let's talk about customer segmentation. Uh, this is a fundamental principle in uh, marketing and it's the concept of identifying which different customers are in your market. They're not all the same and they will have different varying degrees of value, emphasis, and they will have different sensitivity to price. <clears throat> so for example, here is a uh, table. It shows the demand as a function of price. So higher price, high quality will have a lower demand. This is a classic uh, demand curve in economics. Higher price things will have a lower demand in general. Uh, as compared to a lower price. So if you have uh, one product, your sales will be uh, in this region here at a certain price, uh, and you'll capture that part of the market, but uh, you'll uh, not have 
the lower price market, do you not have the higher price market, and you're missing this unaddressed value in the market. So how do you accomplish that? You segment uh, different products that will address the high end, uh, high price market and different products or similar products uh, that address the lower end. And this is, you get more value overall from the market with segmentation. That's a fundamental concept. So customer segmentation is a practice of dividing the customer base into groups uh, in similar ways and similar goals relevant to their uh, characteristics such as age, gender, interests, demographics, spending habits. So we have different uh, approaches to customer segmentation, mass customer segmentation, or looking at segments. A niche is even smaller, micro or individual. Uh, selling to individual people. As marketing gets more sophisticated and digital techniques and, and data gets more sophisticated, we can get further and further into the micro or individual. So we have different types of customer segmentation, geographic, demographic, psychographic, behavioral. Uh, obviously geographic is based on different uh, areas, regions. Uh, they'll have different tastes, different customers, different values. Demographic will be older people, younger people, uh, middle-aged, children, so on and so forth. Uh, demographic characteristics. Uh, uh, psychographic, based on uh, uh, how people are thinking and their cultural aspects and behavioral uh, will also be based on uh, their customer purchasing behaviors. So we have two ways of identifying customer segments. Uh, top down, which is basically looking at the whole customer uh, uh, population, mass market, and then going down from there by choosing various different geographic, demographic, psychographic, behavioral dimensions. Uh, that's the top down approach. The bottom up is to say, well, this is my ideal uh, low cost customer, this is my ideal high cost customer, this is my ideal general customer, defining the ideal customer, and then building up from that, what would be the geographies, what would be the demographics, what would be the behavioral characteristics that then result from that ideal consumer. So top down and bottom up. Uh, if we look at smartphone units, this is a very interesting uh, chart. The blue is Apple. Uh, and the orange is Samsung. This is from a while back, but uh, Apple was the first entrant into the smartphone market and it uh, had uh, a big market share. And then Samsung gradually overtook Apple. And it was interesting because Apple's strategy was to have basically one iPhone, maybe two, and not really segmented out. I mean, their segment was the premium group, but even in that, they had one or two products in every year. Not every year, but they would change with each cycle. Uh, but in general, within a certain cycle, the iPhone 7, the iPhone 8, whatever it may be, there was essentially one or two products. <clears throat> Samsung's strategy was quite different it would create multiple different products. It had the Note, it had the Galaxy, and in many other geographies, it even had multiple types of smartphones and uh, even dozens of different models in order to reach out and get more of these different segments. Uh, and the other purpose of that was to test the market, see what worked and so forth. So that was one reason for the increase in market share by the Samsung approach. Uh, a more wider customer segmentation strategy. Of course, that is a trade-off that's more complex. If you have many different products, the supply chain gets complex, uh, the planning gets complex, the organization gets more uh, difficult as opposed to just focusing on one product or two products uh, as Apple was doing. But nevertheless, that uh, was a very good example of customer segmentation. Another very important concept about the customer is the customer value hierarchy. We talked about value a fair bit of length, uh, but value itself uh, has different levels 
for the customer. There is a core benefit for the customer. So this would be, for example, in a hotel, that this is essentially the value is a place to stay uh, overnight. Uh, the core benefit of a car would be the ability to go from one point to the other in a reasonable period of time. The basic product on top of just staying in a, in a room would be obviously the bed and the sheets. The expected product would be clean bed and sheets. So what's important about this, these are all very obvious, but it implies additional costs, additional service beyond just the fact that this is a room or a place to stay. Then there's the augmented product, which means breakfast. Uh, so people might get the breakfast uh, as part of their stay. It's not essential to the core benefit. And then there are other potential products, uh, other services, tourism, concierge, uh, room service, and so forth. And it is actually around these augmented and potential products that additional value is created for the customer. So the, the core benefit is, of course, very key, but uh, in marketing, it's very important to uh, understand, imagine and understand and deliver this augmented and potential product. Another very important concept uh, is the customers versus the stakeholders. And this is actually quite important in Korean business. Uh, well, compared to, uh, you know, Western business is the stakeholders uh, are often very important in, in Korean business. And these are the employees. This is uh, the, uh, the society, government, uh, et cetera. Uh, a lot of Western businesses focus only on the customers, roughly speaking. And these other stakeholders are less important. But in the Korean ecosystem, it's a much broader vision of these uh, stakeholders, and that becomes very important. What is their value? So we have the internal stakeholders, those are the employees, the manager, the owners. We have the external stakeholders, which are the suppliers, society, government, creditors, shareholders, customers, and that's the company. And uh, value is very important uh, for these stakeholders as well. Uh, I want to emphasize that the central value is the customers, but we have to be realistic that that is not the only uh, value generation, if you will, or value uh, issue for a company needs to think about the stakeholders. So I want to talk very quickly about uh, the readings, and then we will end for today and focus on more of the readings uh, next week. This the second readings uh, talks about uh, R and D marketing integration. Which is more important, marketing or research and development? Um, so this is the article: Should marketing or R and D have more power in the company? And this is a central issue uh, in many companies and a central tension in many companies. So this uh, article explores that. Uh, who should be empowered to encourage pro product program innovativeness, R&D or marketing? Most people assume that innovation comes out of R&D, but innovation also comes out of marketing. And uh, most people assume that the money and the value comes out of marketing and the R&D is more of a support function. And these two extreme views are not correct. It's, the best thing is to consider a mix, but it depends on the market, depends on the company. So in the ideal firm, R&D and marketing should inform and counterbalance each other's, but most companies have a certain bias to either. Uh, especially in highly competitive industries, executives should be resist from making R&D too dominant, uh, just throwing new products and latest technologies on customers. Uh, so it depends on the company lifestyle uh, cycle. In a new market uh, where uh, we don't exactly know how things are uh, going to unfold. We don't know exactly what the customer characteristics are and what their values are. Marketing is often key. In a mere mature market, uh, that often requires radical innovation. So ironically, it's sometimes the opposite. New market, people think R&D is important, but 
but actually marketing is very key. So startups often think about, well, I'm going to do r and I'm going to really focus on a new product, but that's a new market. So uh, startups often ignore the importance of marketing. Uh, they think that comes later. Uh, mature market, ironically, companies are settled. There's a mature market. There's competition. They focus on the marketing. They try to create pricing. They try to create deals or bargains, whatever, try to do that. And they forget actually to do as much of the R&D. So the conclusions are actually opposite to what is often uh, the case. New markets, marketing is very key. So startups, entrepreneurs should really do marketing uh, in addition to kind of coming up with new ideas. And mature markets, they get complacent and settled, often focus too much on marketing and they require more radical innovation. And very important in companies, uh, this is easier in startups or small companies, but very important in big companies, especially are boundary spanners, people or systems that bridge the gap between R&D and marketing. So R&D is separate, marketing is separate, keeping them very separate can be a problem. There has to be communication between them. Those are the key insights from this article. So they talk about relative R&D power. They do develop a mathematical model of new program newness, product program newness, uh, product program meaningfulness, uh, market performance, financial performance, and they see an ideal mix between marketing and R&D. So there are two uh, marketing orientations, uh, product, product oriented, marketing oriented. We talked about this earlier in the lecture. Uh, tools of market orientation or market research, market testing, customer focus, this will be the subject of the next lecture next week, and tools of product orientation or product research, product testing, product focus, and we'll focus on product development in later lectures as well. But the ideal company will combine both of these orientations. So last thing I want to mention is very interesting, marketing innovation. Uh, this is an article from a while back in the New York Times about the Google X Lab. The X Lab uh, is a famous, uh, or I should say Google X, uh, is a famous uh, lab. Everybody knows about it, but the funny thing about this lab is supposed to be top secret uh, lab. And this article is Google's Labs of Wildest Dreams, uh, top secret lab, undisclosed barrier location. This is a Google uh, X. The funny thing about this secret lab is everybody knows about it. The funny thing about this secret lab is that there's a New York Times article about it, many other articles as well. And so the secret of this secret lab is that not only is it creating secret products, but it's not supposed to be a secret. In other words, people are supposed to know that Google has a secret lab. Why is that important? Because Google's secret lab is not just to produce products, or innovations, the purpose of Google's secret lab is for people to uh, have an impression that Google is innovative. In other words, it creates a marketing promotion function. So R&D that's totally separate from marketing uh, is, is not a very sustainable, strong concept. So R&D should have a marketing function and marketing should also have a product development function. This is true even for scientific labs. Let's say we develop this vaccine and a science research lab in Korea develops the vaccine for COVID-19. That would be the most incredible solution. And uh, that would be a huge contribution to the world. But as you may know, we have people that are opposed to vaccines. We have an anti-vaxxer movement and so forth. If we don't successfully uh, bring that vaccine out and convince people and distribute it, in other words, the marketing functions, then all that science is uh, useless. So uh, marketing and innovation go together. That's very uh, critical. So I want to uh, close with one more thought that's very interesting. So or this is not a course on accounting. 
So we talked about value in, in the non-accounting sense of value. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are taking some accounting finance courses and so forth. So you'll have a different perspective on value. We talk about value, the emotional aspects, the multi-dimensions, the opaqueness, the relativeness, the customer-driven aspects of value. Let's uh, address the issue of accounting a little bit. So <clears throat> uh, accounting is very interesting. And uh, if we look at what assets are, uh, 40 years ago, about the vast majority of assets in companies were tangible. Today, it's the exact opposite. Uh, most of the assets in S&P 500, S&P are the big companies in the United States. Global companies are intangible. So this includes patents, data, processes, systems, software. If we look at the value of Facebook, it's all in this data, the value of Google and so forth. So modern accounting hasn't really caught up with this. Uh, so when we talk about value in the marketing sense, ultimately that will have an accounting uh, correlate to that. But uh, I suspect that uh, some aspects of this account, this uh, value that we talked about, very important for marketing, the emotional aspect, the intangible aspect, the relative aspect, uh, modern accounting doesn't entirely account for that. So uh, these marketing concepts that we uh, brought to bear cannot always just be put into numbers. Uh, <clears throat> and I just wanted to end with that thought. So, uh, Next week, we are going to focus on the market analysis, some of the points that we mentioned before, market research, uh, more details about customer segmentation, etc. cetera. So uh, we will end here. Uh, next week, we will talk about market analysis, as I mentioned. I will send you the readings for next week, and then we will have, uh, following the lecture next week, more extended discussion of the readings. Uh, any questions?